Ladies and gentlemen, Jermaine Gephardt. Thank you. My 40th birthday was looming large, whether I wanted it to be or not. So I decided it was time to finally try pursuing a lifelong dream. The thing I wanted to try was something I found very scary and totally taboo. My dream was to try stand-up comedy. Now, I am a painfully shy woman. I'm so shy and quiet, when people meet me, they assume I'm mute. <laughs> I had no public speaking or performing experience. How does someone even go about trying stand-up comedy? So I did what I think most people would do. I Googled. <laughs> I found the website of a local Detroit comic whose first name was Joel. His website was called joelthecomic.com. <laughs> I figured it was as good a place to start as any. I read his blog, I watched his videos, I laughed. I worked up the gumption to actually contact him. So I emailed, Dear Joel, I'm a painfully shy woman who would like to try stand-up comedy. If you could offer me any advice in that regard, I would gladly repay you with a homemade cherry pie. <laughs> I suggested the pie, because baking is something I am great at. For five long weeks, I checked my email. Every day. Every hour. <laughs> Joel never wrote me back. Was he not used to being contacted by strange women offering him pie? <laughs> my cherry pie is the best cherry pie and he will never know what he missed out on <laughs> temporarily set back I needed to come up with a new plan and then I saw it an ad for stand-up comedy classes at Joey's Comedy Club in Livonia, Michigan the classes were the go one night a week for six weeks, ending with a graduation show on the comedy club stage, all for the low, low price of $150. The classes were to be taught by another local comic named Bill Bouchard. Bill Bouchard was a comic that I had never heard of. <laughs> my desire to try stand-up was strong. My desire not to waste my money was stronger because I am a cheapskate. So before I plunked down the cold hard cash for this comedy class, I needed to find out, was this Bill guy even funny? As luck would have it, Bill Bouchard was scheduled to appear that weekend at the comedy club closest to my house, the Ann Arbor Comedy Showcase. So I told my husband, honey, we have to go to the comedy club this weekend. My husband said, um, why? because I have to find out if this guy is funny. Again, he said, um, why? Because he's teaching a comedy class and trying comedy is my dream and, and, and I'm going to be 40. My husband said, okay then, let's do it. Oh my gosh, I can't believe I just revealed my dream is to try stand up to my husband. So that weekend, we go down to the comedy club and get in line to buy tickets. I had never really been to a comedy show before. The first guy came on stage and told jokes for about 10 minutes. At least I think they were supposed to be jokes, but nobody was laughing. It was so quiet in there, you could hear crickets and the occasional, ugh. I started to wonder, did I really wanna try stand up? My husband leaned over and whispered, if this guy's the comedy teacher, save your money. <laughs> it was so tense in there and quiet. The next guy comes up. Ladies and gentlemen, can we have a round of applause for the last guy you saw? Tonight was his make-a-wish. <laughs> so much laughing, the tension was broken. And just like that, he had us in the palm of his hand. He made comedy seem so powerful. I was impressed. This was Bill Bouchard. 
Well, I guess I would sign up for that comedy class. So I contacted the club, registered for the class, and paid my money. Now I had to go through with it, because there was no way I was spending 150 bucks on not getting on that stage. To top it off, the graduation show was scheduled two days shy of my 40th birthday. Talk about your milestones. The night of the first comedy class finally arrived. I had my babysitter all lined up and I was ready to go. I walked out the door to get in my car, turned on my heel, ran back in the house and puked my guts out. <laughs> I started talking myself out of going. A little voice in my head started saying, this is wrong, you're so selfish, you should not draw attention to yourself this way. Now that might sound like it doesn't make much sense considering my dream was to try stand up until you know about the family I come from. I was raised in the 60s, a middle child. My younger brother is severely mentally retarded and autistic, and my older brother is both autistic and schizophrenic. Back in the 60s, autism was much rarer. Whenever I would tell people I had two autistic brothers, they would always say, oh, artistic? <laughs> oh. What do they like to draw? <laughs> and I would have to explain, no, not artistic, autistic. My brothers don't draw, they withdraw. <laughs> <laughs> Our family doctor had advised my parents to, quote, put them away in an institution and forget about them they will never contribute anything useful to society, unquote. Thanks, Dr. Mengele. <laughs> <laughs> this devastated my parents, but having no real alternative at the time, they took the doctor's advice and had my brothers committed to a mental institution. I remember every Friday driving there to pick up my brothers and bring them home for the weekend, it was a nightmarish place. The steel doors would creak open and all you could hear down the hallway were groans and screams. There were people wandering around in straight jackets all glassy eyed and other people sitting on the floor in puddles of their own urine. Every Sunday night, we would take my brothers back there and the whole drive home, my mom would just cry. During the week, while my brothers weren't home with us, my parents would stay up late and watch The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. Whenever there was a stand-up comic on, oh, how they would laugh and laugh. It was the most relaxed and happy I had ever seen my parents. It made a deep impression on me. One day, my mom came to the realization that doctors don't know everything, and we went to the institution and brought my brothers home to live with us for good. <laughs> Anything was better than that place, but still, it wasn't easy. The prevailing wisdom of the day was that autism was caused by a lack of affection from the mother. They even had a term for it, refrigerator mothers. This crushed my mom, and she bent over backwards to prove to the world she was not one of those refrigerator mothers. But it didn't matter how much love she poured on my brothers, they didn't get better. Their behavior was strange, unpredictable, and sometimes violent. One time, my younger brother knocked over our huge refrigerator right on top of me. My problem wasn't refrigerator mothers, it was refrigerator brothers. <laughs> Another time, as a teenager, my older brother went to the local gun shop and tried to buy a gun. The owner asked him, what do you need a gun for? He said, to kill my parents. <laughs> Autistic people tend to be honest to a fault. <laughs> <laughs> the gun shop owner took my brother's paperwork in the back room and called my parents. You better come down here and pick up your son. We were lucky. It could have turned out very differently. I know my parents really had their hands full with my brothers, but still, I was a child and I desperately needed their attention. 
At age five, I tried to impress them by teaching myself to read from the Encyclopedia Britannica. They said, you're so smart, I bet you could find a cure for autism. Sometimes when my mom was really overwhelmed, she would feed us rotten meat and cough syrup for dinner. I think she was hoping we would just go to sleep and stay asleep. <laughs> By age eight, I taught myself how to cook. <laughs> I didn't have birthday parties because my brothers couldn't have birthday parties. I wasn't allowed to have friends over because my brothers didn't even have friends. I developed deep shame about ever drawing any attention to myself. I had major survivor's guilt. Why were my brothers born with all these problems while I was not? At age 18, I moved out of my parents' house. I had a lot of creative desires, but too much guilt to act on them. I floundered around in college, winding up with six years of majoring in undecided. <laughs> I had a series of odd jobs, and when I say odd, I mean one time I was paid a dollar an hour to wear a gorilla suit to advertise a pet shop. <laughs> In the 1980s, the state of Michigan closed down its mental institutions and moved everybody to community-based group homes instead. I worked at a few of these group homes. For me, it was my way of having a bit of a do-over. 22 years after moving out of my parents' house, I'm in the bathroom puking my guts out. I get myself together, brush my teeth, and I go to that comedy class. It was a mixed bag of students. There was me, a construction worker, a businesswoman, a former radio DJ, and a stripper. <laughs> During one class, the stripper got on stage and announced, my ex-husband is a professional comic, and he said, I'll have a hard time doing comedy because I'm so beautiful, it'll distract the audience. You won't have that problem, Jermaine. <laughs> oh, well, we'll see about that. <laughs> the night of the graduation show finally came and the house was packed. Bill Bouchard told me I was going to go last. I was scared to death. When my turn finally came, I took a deep breath, I got on that stage, I stepped up to the microphone and said, hi everybody, my name is Jermaine. Yes, I am Michael Jackson's brother. <laughs> we both kind of look like white women. <laughs> Huge laughs. They liked me. They really liked me. Finally, it was okay to enjoy people giving me attention for 10 whole minutes. <laughs> I've been doing stand-up for 13 years now. Thanks. For those of you into math, that makes me 53 years old. <laughs> I've made some money, worked with some famous people, and have done hundreds of shows. And even though I'm still that shy, nervous, guilty-feeling little girl inside, I make myself get up on that stage, and I enjoy letting everybody pay attention to me. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Hard. <laughs> Laugh your troubles away. <laughs> <laughs>